It turns out that every year these antlers fall off, every single year, and every year they're replaced. New antlers grow, and every time the new antler grows, it acquires a new point. And so eventually, we talk about six-point bucks. These are deers that have had six years to develop these different points. Think what that means. At the base of the skull of the deer, right where my finger is, right there, is an area on the skull of the deer, which is different from our skull, called um, a pedicle. And on that pedicle are a series of little tissues that are in a little ring that are full of stem cells. And at appropriate moment, when the deer antler has fallen off, those stem cells then get into action and grow an entire new antler that's perfect every time. And not only that, it has a different pattern according to how old the, uh, 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 the deer is. And finally, it does it at an enormous speed. So when this guy is going full tilt for growing an antler, because this has to happen every season, because he uses these for display to get girls. This area right here has to be pumping out new um, growth at two centimeters a day. And the growth is all from the tip. So it looks just like a blastema. OK, now, that being said, uh, it doesn't obviously lend itself particularly to any kind of medical um, applications. And I'd like to finish off today by talking about a slightly more serious subject. And that is the possibility that we have smaller numbers of stem cells. And that's why we can't keep up with trauma and serious injury. Now, you heard from Doug that, in fact, the bone marrow is a very rich source of stem cells that turn over very, very rapidly, although they are proportionally in very small numbers. And so the possibility might be that these bone marrow cells could zoom around on a highway in our bodies and fix things as they found problems. And this was a very popular idea um, and has actually given rise to a number of very exciting clinical trials in which bone marrow cells are being used to try to cure various diseases. But I'd like to talk about another source of stem cells, namely cells that are resident within a particular tissue and don't circulate on the stem cell highway. And in this case, I'll talk about muscle because I know a little bit about it. And in muscle, as I said, fibers contain many nuclei, but they also contain within them rare little cells, stem cells, called satellite cells, which I've mentioned before, that are capable of responding to injury by proliferating. So they have, in some ways, a sort of a stem cell like nature. The problem is that there aren't that many of them. And in fact, in a devastating disease like muscular dystrophy, where the muscle is weakened by a genetic lesion, robbing it of an essential protein and causing it to be fragile, every time it's used, it actually breaks and has to be replaced. The stem cells can keep up with this for a while, but eventually, there just aren't enough. And so, at that point, what happens is that the muscle loses its capacity to contract. The injuries, instead of being replenished, actually act like a wound heal and turn into scar and fibrotic tissue. And the muscle becomes actually quite paralyzed. So an obvious way to think about this would be to replenish their waning cells in their muscles with some kind of a stem cell that could at least help with the um, Co uh, the consequences of this disease, if not the cause. So in my lab, I've been working on just such a question with my colleague Antonio Musaro at the University of Rome. So together, we wanted to de develop a question of um, just such a nature. Could we take a bone marrow cell and make it contribute in some way to muscle that was injured? So to do this experiment, we had to set it up and because we work with mice, we can engineer mice to express all sorts of wonderful uh, proteins. And in this case, we used a mouse that we had in the lab in which the same alkaline phosphatase gene you heard about from Doug as a marker was driven by a regulatory element that activates it only in those skeletal muscle fibers. So if you look inside this mouse, as you see on the right, the muscle fibers are, for the most part, 
a sort of a dark purpley blue when we stain them. And that means they're expressing this gene, which we call HAP. So if we see HAP, it means the cell is a muscle cell. Now what we do is we remove bone marrow from this mouse. Now because the mouse is transgenic for that marker, that means it's genetically engineered so that all of its cells have that marker, the bone marrow cells actually contain this marker, but it's silent. Why? Because it's not a muscle cell at the moment, it's a bone marrow cell. And so it doesn't recognize the signals to turn on the HAP gene. So the question is, will these bone marrow cells ever turn purple if we put them into the right context? Now what's the right context? In this case, we're going to use a mouse model of muscular dystrophy called the MDX mouse. This mouse is actually um, a very well-studied mouse. It undergoes some of the same problems as the boys. Mice escape the real devastating effects of muscular dystrophy, but their muscle looks awful. It looks just like that picture of that little boy's muscle, constantly regenerating, constantly degenerating. And so we asked the question, could we improve the muscle of the mouse functionally, and could we stave off the devastating effects of the disease? So we did the experiment. We introduced into a vein in the mouse's leg some of these bone marrow cells from our HAP mouse and asked, do we ever see any cells that engraft into the muscle and turn purple? Because if we see them turning purple, we know they come from the HAP mouse, they come from bone marrow, and they're becoming muscle. And every once in a while, we saw one of these. About 1% to 2% of the skeletal muscles in the mouse actually turned purple. Unfortunately, 1% to 2% isn't going to cure a muscular dystrophic boy. So we had to think of other ways in which we could augment this rare but very exciting result. And we did so using a growth factor. Now in this case, we used a growth factor called insulin-like growth factor one. And like the growth factors you heard about from Doug, it's a growth factor that actually promotes growth, but it promotes a number of other things as well. It's important for growth in the fetus. It's not so important for growth in our bodies. It promotes all sorts of different kinds of cell uh, functions, and then eventually it is very uh, interestingly induced in response to injury locally. So if you injure muscle or you injure any part of your body, IGF-1 is transiently expressed. Now what does it do? It's a growth factor, it's a molecule, and it circulates around the cell milieu looking for a receptor to bind to. Once it binds to the surface of the cell, it sends a cell signal, an intracellular signal, that eventually ends up in a transcriptional event which turns on a whole set of genes. And we can study those genes in the same way that Doug explained to you with chips. But for today's lecture, we'll let, just talk about the way in which IGF-1 works at the level of the body. Locally, it's expressed, as I said, in response to injury and in muscle and in heart, it tends to induce growth. And it's also expressed by the liver. And in this case, it circulates throughout the body but we can get away without the stuff that's circulating in the body. And in fact, we find that the circulating form of IGF-1 has none of the same properties as the form that's made in the muscle itself. So we had the chance then to make a mouse that was expressing more than its normal share of IGF-1 in the skeletal muscle. And we did that with transgenesis. And it's the same way we made the hap mouse, and we do it by taking a fertilized egg out of a mouse and injecting it physically with DNA encoding our IGF-1 protein. The gene of IGF-1 goes in there, in this case driven with a muscle-specific regulatory element. That embryo is transferred into a foster mother, and that foster mother gives rise to pups, some of which hopefully got the gene. And if so, those pups then can be used to study the effects of IGF-1 in the muscle. And what we found was when we mated those IGF-1 animals to the MDX mouse and did the same experiment, we got a very exciting result, which you can see on the right. The one on the left is the same story I told you before. And the one on the right is what happens when we inject bone marrow cells marked with HAP into an MDX mouse that's also expressing this growth factor in the muscle, at which point 15 to 20% of the cells are blue or purple instead of one to 2%. So we're seeing a remarkable increase in the capacity for these cells to actually t get up, taken up 